Hello, and welcome back to Classic Film Montgomery Clift and Other Great Actors Podcasts. This is Wendy, and today I want to talk about Lee Marvin. I also want to remind you that you can find video clips from Lee Marvin's movies on the website Classic Film Montgomery Clift and Other Great Actors in the Lee Marvin blog. Please also check out my YouTube channel under Classic Film Montgomery Clift and Other Great Actors, where you can find some of my other podcasts. Lee Marvin a wild one. Lee Marvin was a colorful character who marched to the beat of his own drum. Coming from a line of noted historical figures, Lee would also distinguish himself as a war hero. But his brutal war experience brought his demons ever closer to the surface, leading him to seek oblivion in alcohol. Even so, Lee managed to quietly put together a stellar career in film and television. How did Lee Marvin succeed with the odds so stacked against him? Lee Marvin's Impressive Lineage On February 19, 1924, the world became a little more interesting with the birth of a child named Lee Marvin. His mother, Courtney, a southern aristocrat, named him after his first cousin, four times removed, General Robert E. Lee. Courtney also boasted of having George Washington included in her family tree. She was very lady of the manor, though Lee's father, Lamont Marvin, did not quite support them in that lifestyle. Lamont had interesting relatives of his own, including his uncle Ross Marvin, who was a polar explorer and would meet a mysterious end while on an expedition with Robert Peary, who at the time claimed to be the first to reach the North Pole. Lamont would often work as a salesman and Courtney would write for magazines and newspapers. The family moved several times when Lamont would find new jobs. Lee Marvin's Childhood Lee was a rebellious kid from the start. He seemed to dislike his mother and her fancy heirs. He was close with his brother Robert, who was only a couple years older than Lee. Lee also seemed to revere his father, who was a World War I veteran, but could be physically abusive to both the kids and Courtney. School was quite difficult for Lee. He was a bit of a daydreamer, not very focused on things he felt were boring, but very outgoing and lively. He was never one to shirk from a fight, but also started a fair share of them. Lee was continually being kicked out of schools from grade school to high school. World War II At the age of 18, Lee joined the Marine Corps in the hopes of fighting in World War II. His father and brother had also joined the service in the Army. Lee was sent overseas to the Pacific and was in the Battle of Saipan where he sustained several gunshot wounds, the most severe of which severed his sciatic nerve. He was discharged from the Marines and was presented the Purple Heart. He was also permanently disabled in terms of the armed forces, meaning he could not return to the Marines. Unfortunately, Lee was also emotionally wounded, having seen much death and gruesome incidents. One specifically is detailed in the Lee Marvin biography, Lee Marvin Point Blank by Dwayne Epstein and is beyond horrific. It's quite likely that Lee did suffer thereafter from PTSD, which was not widely diagnosed at the time. Note, Lee Marvin's biography, Lee Marvin Point Blank by Dwayne Epstein, was one of the sources used to research this podcast. I highly recommend this book if you wish to learn even more about Lee Marvin. It's interesting, well-researched, and factual, and I've included a link from Amazon on the blog on the website. Lee Marvin Returns to Civilian Life After recovering from his injury, Lee set about trying to achieve his high school diploma, which would elude him. The family was, at this time, living in Woodstock, New York. Lee began having nightmares, and his drinking intensified. Along with the drinking would also come the fighting. He would deliberately provoke fights. When not fighting and drinking, Lee was working as a plumber's assistant. It's quite possible that things would have continued on like this, or even worsened, had fate not interceded. The Beginnings of an Actor Random chance can sometimes change a person's life. Such was the case with Lee Marvin. A nearby theater called Maverick Theater was presenting a play and needed an actor to play a loud-mouthed Texan. It was suggested to the theater people that Lee Marvin was certainly a loud mouth, so Lee was brought in to try out for the part. 
The theater manager was impressed with this tall kid with a fantastic voice and gave him the role. The rest is history. The end. Just kidding. But it was the beginning of a great love for Lee, the love of acting. It also seemed to give him a sense of purpose that was previously missing in his life. Lee threw himself into acting, continuing on in stock theater. He was a natural actor and again had a wonderful voice for the stage. He would enroll in the American Theater Wing through his GI Bill and after graduating began appearing in off-Broadway plays. Lee's goal was to get into a Broadway play but saw a casting call for Hollywood director Henry Hathaway and decided to go and try out. He was hired as an extra for a couple of films. Lee then finally got into a Broadway play called Billy Budd. However, he was playing an extremely small role. He began to feel unimpressed with stage acting and decided to go off to Hollywood and see Hathaway again. Lee Marvin in Hollywood Henry Hathaway introduced Lee to an agent named Meyer Mishkin, who took Lee on as a client. Meyer Mishkin had a great knack for promoting his actors, Charles Bronson being another of his clients. In fact, he got both Charles and Lee in the film You're in the Navy Now, 1951, which was a first film for both. Meyer also kept his clients from signing long-term contracts with Hollywood Studios. This gave them the versatility to work for any studio, making it easier to find them roles. Unfortunately, these roles tended to be very small, uncredited roles. Lee also did work in television as well, playing small parts. Betty Ebeling While attending a party in Hollywood, Lee met a young singer named Betty Ebeling. She had been abandoned at the party, and he escorted her home. This led to further dates. An interesting thing about Betty is that for a time, she was nanny for Joan Crawford. It's interesting when she speaks about the family life of Joan Crawford because it does mirror a lot of what is said by Christina Crawford in her Mommy Dearest book. It seems to lend some legitimacy to Christina's claims. But back to Lee. In February of 1952, Lee and Betty got married. They would eventually have four children. Betty seemed a patient, calm sort of person, probably a good stabilizing force for Lee. Lee was certainly not the easiest person to deal with. He had always maintained his drinking, which would just progressively get worse throughout his life. He was prone to whip out his guns and just take to shooting things. Fortunately, not people. He would disappear for a day or two when he felt like it. Betty was the one who raised the children and took care of the house with little to no assistance from Lee, though that was common in that era. She was also there to support him in the beginning of his film career. Lee Marvin, professional actor. Lee wasn't getting fancy leading roles in the early days, but he was working consistently. Lee was a good actor who was very professional and abided by the actor's ethics. Scene stealing is a good example of what actors considered unethical. It was an unwritten rule in old Hollywood that while another actor was having a big scene, it was important to stay still and not move. Scene-stealing actors would touch their hat, pick up objects, or move around in order to draw attention to themselves. This was a great annoyance to other actors. Lee is always very still when another actor has a big scene. Watch his films for this, especially his earlier films. Also, despite his alcoholism, Lee was usually on time for his scenes with dialogue learned and ready to shoot. This made him popular with directors and producers. However, he was still generally unknown to the public. The Big Heat, 1953. Sometimes playing a really horrendous character is as effective in getting noticed by the public as playing the leading man. A good case in point is Richard Widmar. That was also the case for Lee Marvin in The Big Heat. Playing a really nasty guy, Vince Stone, Lee does such rotten things as stubbing out a cigarette on a girl's hand, murdering the wife of a cop, and throwing hot coffee on poor Gloria Graham's face. In fact, there's a little clip of the coffee throwing incident on the blog. This is the film that really brought Lee to everyone's attention and he began to get substantially better roles. The Wild One, 1953. Case in point, he then made a film with one of the biggest stars of the 1950s, Marlon Brando. 
However, according to Stanley Kramer, the usually likable actor's actor, Lee Marvin, was not especially well liked by Marlon. It could be because Marlon sensed Lee had the potential to upstage him. In fact, he wasn't wrong. Marlon doesn't really ever come off convincingly as the leader of a biker gang, despite his leather jacket and jeans and sulky attitude. I don't believe anyone could be convinced that Marlon could beat Lee Marvin in a fight. Lee, on the other hand, though obviously too old for the role, looks the part of a biker. In fact, it's Lee's character that was more revered among actual bikers at the time. But please, feel free to judge for yourself who comes off more authentic by checking out some of the video clips on the blog. These two films would bring Lee Marvin a lot of work as a film bad guy and a film goofball. Some notable films during this time were The Kane Mutiny, 1954, his only film with Humphrey Bogart, Bad Day at Black Rock, which is an exceptional film with an incredible cast, and Violent Sunday, 1955, with Victor Mator. He did a turn as a musician in Pete Kelly's Blues, 1955, which he must have enjoyed being a huge fan of the blues. In the late 1950s, he bounced between television and film, but didn't really have any standout roles at this time. This didn't especially matter to Lee, he just wanted to work. He did have another small role in a film that was notable for a rather unfortunate reason. Raintree County, 1957. Sadly, Raintree County's greatest distinction is the fact that Montgomery Clift smashed his face to bits during production in a horrible car accident. The stellar cast of this film deserved a better vehicle. However, Lee is a bright spot in the film, breathing a little life and vitality to his small part as Flash Perkins, the self-professed fastest man in Raintree County. There are several clips on the blog from Raintree County. Flash runs around town calling himself the fastest man in Raintree County until John Shaughnessy, played by Montgomery Clift, challenges him to a race on the 4th of July. The professor, played by Nigel Patrick, has put money on John and wants to secure his bet. The professor knows Flash is a drinker and that John has never had a drink in his life. He devises a plan to get Flash drunk while giving John tea instead of bourbon. However, Garwood, Rod Taylor, who has the bet against the professor, figures out what's going on and insists both Flash and John drink from the same bottle. It should be noted that a stuntman was supposed to be doing the stunts in this scene for Lee Marvin, but he was having trouble with them. Lee insisted he could do the stunts and completed them quite effortlessly. It's a little hard to believe that Lee and Monty are young men in their late teens, early 20s. Also, John winds up beating Flash in the race, and thereafter, Flash considers him a great friend and constantly refers to him as the fastest man in Raintree County. Lee punctuates his speeches with all these funny idioms. He is really so charismatic in this role. M Squad starring Lee Marvin. After Raintree County came another big break for Lee Marvin. He was chosen to star in a television series, M Squad, as Detective Frank Bollinger. This was a very successful series and ran for several years. Unfortunately, playing the same character all the time was difficult for Lee. He began to become bored. It was similar to stage work, playing the same character through the run of the play. He hadn't liked that either. He couldn't get out of his contract. Lee became restless and depressed. His unhappiness began to spill over into his personal life. Eventually, he got out of his contract for M Squad, but a great deal of damage had already been done in his marriage. Lee would continue, however, doing television through much of the early 1960s, including a stint on The Untouchables. He was very careful to only do a couple episodes. He was also in a couple John Wayne Westerns, The Comancheros, 1961, and The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, 1962, both playing bad guys. Lee had been wanting to work with John Ford and was thrilled to be cast in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. John Ford was delighted with Lee and thought he stole the film from John Wayne and possibly even James Stewart. Lee made a friend on this film, Woody Strode, who was a great drinking buddy. Since John Ford enjoyed working with Lee Marvin and vice versa, Lee was offered a role in yet another John Wayne film, Donovan's Reef, 1963. This film is not John Ford's best work, nor is it John Wayne's best work. 
it seems a faded copy of other John Ford, John Wayne movies. However, Lee Marvin is a delight in this film. There is a quick clip on the blog from Donovan's Reef. Guns, who is played by John Wayne, lives on the Pacific Island. Boats, Gahuli, played by Lee, is his frenemy who has the same birthday. They always fight on their birthday, or they just fight in general. The Killers, 1964. Though Lee was happy to have worked with John Ford, he didn't really feel he was where he should be in his career. He was again relegated to doing a lot of television. He could not have felt like he was advancing in his career. But a turning point was coming and it began with The Killers. Lee plays Charlie, a hitman, sent to kill Johnny North, played by John Cassavetes. He has a fellow younger hitman along, Lee, played by Clue Gulliger. Johnny is teaching at a school for the blind, and Charlie and Lee terrorize the blind secretary. Clue Gulliger is excessively fidgety and annoying in this role. I suppose that's what he was going for, and Lee was remarkably patient with his scene-stealing antics. There are some clips from The Killers on the blog. Once they kill Johnny, Charlie begins to be suspicious about how easily the hit went down. After running around threatening folks, they find the man in charge, Jack, played by Ronald Reagan. Lee wasn't a big fan of Ronald Reagan, but was very professional towards him on the set. He also thought Ronald to be a subpar actor, which was pretty accurate. Cat Ballou, 1965. If the killers helped revive a somewhat stagnant career, Cat Ballou put him on the path of stardom. At first, the film didn't seem like much. In fact, Lee wasn't certain he even wanted to be in the film. Supposedly, Betty convinced him to look again at the script and he decided to go ahead with the roles. Lee plays two characters in this film, Kid Shaleen, a drunk over-the-hill gunfighter, and Tim Strawn, a bad guy, out terrorizing the innocent ranchers and cowboys. Both roles are more caricatures than characters, and no one is better at that kind of role than Lee Marvin. Though I would also consider Charles Lawton in that category, specifically in Hobson's Choice. Anyhow, there's something oddly genuine in these ridiculously silly characters he plays. I'm not the only one who thinks this, considering he won an Oscar for such a silly comedic role. If you think that's an easy feat, look back on the Oscars throughout the golden age of Hollywood and see how often such roles win Oscars. It says something about Lee Marvin who honestly at this point had not even reached the pinnacle of his career. This film begins with the much used premise of the evil railroad executives trying to threaten people off their property by hiring gunmen. Cat, played by Jane Fonda, her father refuses to comply and is shot by said gunman, Tim Strawn, played by Lee Marvin. Cat has hired a famous gunfighter to help, Kid Shalane, again Lee Marvin. However, Kid Shalene turns out to be a terrible drunk and not keen to fight Tim Strawn. There are clips of Cat Baloo on the blog. Cat is threatened by Tim. This causes Kid to decide to take on Tim. If you watch the clips on the blog, you'll notice the way Lee disguised his rather distinctive voice when playing Tim Strawn. Kid gets himself all spiffed up and goes out to find Tim. In a very funny hallway scene where Lee was apparently almost too drunk to walk, he opens random doors until he finds Tim. He manages to kill Tim, but when relating the incident to Kat, they find out something rather surprising. Later, Kat winds up being taken to jail and is about to be hung. Her friends have planned a scheme to rescue her, but they find Kid has fallen back into his old ways. You'll find this particular scene on the blog with Lee and the horse and this is one of the most famous scenes from the film and what caused Lee to say in his acceptance speech at the Oscars quote I think though half of this belongs to a horse someplace out in the valley end quote Lee Marvin is a fool Lee's next film Ship of Fools 1965 had Lee playing a racist unlikable washed up baseball player Not only did he play a fool in this film, but he behaved like a fool in real life. As I mentioned, Lee and Betty's marriage was on the rocks after M Squad. Lee had never been an angel in the marriage. He had been involved in affairs previously. However, Betty always stood by him, and I think he depended on her in a way. 
During production of Ship of Fools, Lee met a two-bit Hollywood groupie named Michelle Triola. She was fairly notorious in Hollywood circles and most actors were smart enough to keep away from her. She set her cap for Lee and he was easily captivated. This would be the last straw for Betty and would become a nightmare for Lee. Ship of Fools is a wonderful film and Lee got to play a lot of his scenes with the legendary Vivian Lee. He and Vivian got along quite well together during the production. She liked his irreverent, tell it like it is personality. There are clips from Ship of Fools on the blog. Vivian plays Mary Treadwell, a middle-aged Southern lady. She is forced to sit with Tenny, played by Lee, a washed up American baseball player because of the lack of seats. He immediately displays his crass and boorish personality. Tenny is also trying to purchase services from one of the dancers on the boat. We can add cheap and lewd to the descriptions of his character. As a prank, Tenny is told the wrong room number for the girl he wants to force his intentions upon. Unfortunately, the prank goes severely awry. This is just one of the many storylines in Ship of Fools. There is a very touching and beautiful storyline between the ship's doctor and a Spanish countess who is being sent to prison. It's truly a very worthy film to see and takes on the sensitive topic of social injustice. When Lee went to the Academy Awards, it had been his intention to take Betty. However, he had been separated from Betty and shacking up with Michelle. Michelle supposedly threatened to commit suicide if he didn't take her, so he just took her instead. Lee's next film was The Professionals, 1966, with an all-star cast that included Robert Ryan, Burt Lancaster, Ralph Bellamy, Jack Palance, and old friend Woody Strode. Directed by Richard Brooks, it's a great Western-style film featuring Lee Marvin as the leader of a group hired to return the kidnapped wife of a rich man. However, they find out much later that things are not what they seem. Lee was pretty drunk during a lot of this film, and up to some crazy antics such as shooting arrows from a bow and arrow at signs from a Vegas hotel. In addition, he would hang showgirls out the windows. Note, no showgirls were harmed in this. I guess what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, or winds up here in this podcast. He did not get along with Burt Lancaster. Burt could be quite insecure. For example, Burt didn't like the fact that Woody Strode was being filmed in a costume which showed his impressive muscles and had it ordered that he was to wear something less revealing. Nevertheless, no matter how drunk Lee was or how much he didn't like Burt Lancaster, he never let it affect his performance. In 1967, Lee and Betty got a divorce. Lee had been living with Michelle for a couple years by this time. The Dirty Dozen, 1967. Possibly Lee Marvin's best known film, The Dirty Dozen was filmed in England and directed by Robert Aldrich. Lee also got top billing in this film with a very talented cast that includes Robert Ryan, Ernest Borgnine, Charles Bronson, John Cassavetes, Telly Savalas, and Donald Sutherland. There are clips from the Dirty Dozen on the blog. Major Reisman, Lee, is sent out to a prison to pick out 12 men to participate in a covert and dangerous mission. Many of the men are sentenced to hang. Major Reisman assigns them numbers and asks them to drill. However, one prisoner, Franco, John Cassavetes, is not too cooperative. After selecting the men, they wind up training for a while and building their own barracks. However, Major Reisman feels they aren't gelling as a team. Franco, as usual, is creating trouble, rebelling against shaving in cold water. The rest of the prisoners agree. After the men complete their training, Major Reisman has some ladies brought in. The brass gets wind of this, which is against regulation. They haul Major Reisman in to give him a talking to. Point Blank, 1967. Point Blank was just the film to compliment the Dirty Dozen. Lee is back to his killer ways, his character quite similar to Charlie in The Killers. His co-star on this film is Angie Dickinson, whom he also worked with in The Killers. Point Blank is considered a neo-noir. In fact, Point Blank was the first neo-noir film in America to use color and the widescreen to conjure an environment of enclosure and displacement. There are clips from Point Blank on the blog. 
Lee plays Walker, a man out to get revenge on his wife and his partner who swindled him and tried to murder him. He is also looking to recover the money. His first stop is to visit the wife and find the man that cheated him. Though he doesn't find the man, Reese, there, he is not about to give up. He manages to track Reese down with the help of his wife's sister, played by Angie Dickinson, and threatens him until he divulges the names of all the members of the organization. While hunting all these men down and trying to retrieve his money, Walker still has some time to dally with Chris, the wife's sister. Paint Your Wagon, 1969. I'm not sure who looked at Lee Marvin and thought, musical, but somehow Lee managed to make it work. Though the production was a complete disaster and Lee was drunk a good bit of the time, which fit the character perfectly, he still gives a fantastic performance in a role no one could have expected to see him play. There is a clownish element to this character as well, somewhat similar to Cat Ballou. But we are no longer seeing Lee Marvin here. We are seeing Ben Rumson, a tough, old, drunken, gold-mining man who gets melancholy. There are so many hilarious parts to this movie and the commitment of Lee Marvin as he throws himself around, including face down into a stream, is so impressive. Lee's performance on this film fills me with joy every time I watch it and it truly holds a special place in my heart. Unfortunately, the earthiness and vitality of his character really makes Clint Eastwood's character look quite wooden. While Lee is able to embrace the character, Clint seems uncomfortable in this type of role. Ben is a gold miner in a little mining camp who rescues a farmer almost dead from exposure. While digging the grave for the farmer's brother, gold is found and Ben quickly claims the grave and includes the unconscious farmer as his partner. He nurses the farmer back to health and calls him partner, played by Clint Eastwood. There are clips of Painter Wagon on the blog. While on one of his drunken binges, Ben wakes up to find there is a woman in the tavern with a baby, played by Gene Seberg. He is shocked because there are never any women around. He soon finds out what is going on after some rather funny mixing up of words. Ben winds up marrying the woman, Elizabeth. However, a problem arises with Ben having the only woman in the entire camp. Men stare at her constantly, causing Ben to become jealous and enraged. A town meeting is called after he throws a knife at one of them. A plan is hatched to hijack a stagecoach carrying a bunch of ladies of ill repute. At first, the town is against them, but Partner begins using reverse psychology to convince the townspeople. Everything is going quite well, especially after Elizabeth decides she'd like to have both Partner and Ben as her husbands. Unfortunately, more farmers show up, sick and frozen, and they are brought to the house. Elizabeth suddenly feels ashamed of their lifestyle and pretends she is only married to Partner. This means Ben has to stay elsewhere. Meanwhile, the son of the farmers is a fan of Ben's and follows him to go gold mining. Ben decides to give him a tour of all the town's attractions. Also in this film, you get to see Lee Marvin sing and dance. In fact, he sang several songs in this film and his song, Wandering Star, was a hit song. It's probably safe to say that the mid to late 60s were the best years of Lee Marvin's career. He also had a good film to start 1970 called Monty Walsh. He was rumored to have an affair with his co-star, Jean Moreau. This put the nail in the coffin of his relationship with Michelle Triola. You reap what you sow. By 1970, Lee could no longer deal with the toxic relationship with Michelle. He would begin hiding out from her, staying away from his house. Eventually, he had his agent tell her she had to leave the house. However, Michelle could be very determined, slash crazy, but Lee thwarted her by quickly marrying a woman named Pamela Feely, who he had known from his days in Woodstock, New York. It was odd to have suddenly married what seemed to be a virtual stranger, but I think Lee wanted that peace he had with Betty. Indeed, Lee seems to have calmed down remarkably in both the drinking and crazy antics in his second marriage. Michelle refused to go away. She sued Lee, claiming to be a common law wife as she had lived with him for six years. This was the first 
palimony case in the United States, and the court originally ordered Lee to pay Michelle $140,000. Happily, the case was overturned on appeal, but that did not happen until 1981. Michelle would go on to become involved with Dick Van Dyke. The Iceman Cometh, 1973. The Iceman Cometh was a Eugene O'Neill play, very stagey, wordy, and long. It's the kind of dialogue that requires a really talented actor. This perhaps was not the kind of film best suited for Lee Marvin. Also in this film are Robert Ryan and Frederick March, both who are phenomenal in the film and both suffering from terminal cancer. Robert Ryan especially didn't even survive to see the film released. I think Lee may have realized during production that he was a little outclassed in this film. He was slightly intimidated by the talent of Frederick March. It could not have been easy to make a film with both actors at the end of their lives. Robert Ryan was also a longtime friend. There are some clips from The Iceman Cometh on the blog. Lee plays Hickey, one of a group of men who gather at a bar owned by Harry, played by Frederick March. They seem to form some secret society and talk endlessly about the cause without giving any clear understanding of what the cause is. At least, not that I could figure. Admittedly, I was not able to make it through the entire film. My best guess is that they are supposed to be socialists at the time when communism was being ferreted out in the United States. But I could be completely wrong. Hickey comes in one day and announces he's a changed man and won't be drinking. He then tries to get them all to reform. Most adversarial to Hickey is Larry, played by Robert Ryan, who seems to have lost the will to live and is just a shell of a person. Don't feel badly if you can't figure out what's going on. They speak constantly in riddles in this film. I'm sure it's critically acclaimed writing, but it's a lot of work just to watch a film. At some point, it's revealed that Hick Hickey's wife has been murdered. Actually, he's the one that reveals it. Later, he admits to everyone that he is the one that killed her. Jeff Bridges is also in this film as a young man who latches onto Larry because Larry was close with his mother, who was also part of the cause. That's a whole other muddle, though. Finally, the police come to take Hickey away. I wish I could provide more insightful commentary about this film. Perhaps someone can tell us more about it in the comments. I'm afraid it's just over my head. I applaud Lee Marvin for trying to take on this role, but when compared with the excellent performances of Ryan and March and even Jeff Bridges, his performance, though good, seems a little over the top. Twilight Years <laughs> Lee Marvin continued to make films for another decade. Some notable films from this time period were Avalanche Express, 1978, The Big Red One, 1980, and Gorky Park, 1983. His final film was The Delta Force, 1986. Lee had spent most of his adult life drinking and smoking, and in 1986, his health began to fail. He had trouble breathing and was given steroids. This caused a rupture in his intestines. Eventually, he was just hooked up to machines, lying in a hospital, which had to have been devastating for such a vital guy. On August 19, 1987, Lee Marvin suffered a fatal heart attack. He was 63 years old. He is buried with military honors at Arlington Cemetery. Lee once said, quote, Jesus, give me my span of years and knock me down when it's all over. You've got to make room for the other guy. I know that when my ashes are blown away or they stuff me in a sewer, it's not going to hurt. I've had the simple pleasure of being present when the sun was shining and the rain was falling. I've had mine and nobody can take it away from me. This is the end of Lee Marvin, A Wild One. Don't forget to check out the website at Classic Film Montgomery Clift and Other Great Actors and my YouTube channel at Classic Film Montgomery Clift and Other Great Actors. And we'll see you at the next podcast.